I remember when I was a fellow, there were no advocacy groups at all for lung cancer, none. And then this one came along called Alcase, and they came up with a ribbon. And it was a clear plastic ribbon. They called it the invisible ribbon uh, because no one seemed to be aware that lung cancer existed or no one cared about it despite the fact that it was the number one cancer killer. Um, and so, you know, it soon became evident after a few years that a clear ribbon that nobody could see <laughs> wasn't, very, um, wasn't very practical. So it's kind of morphed into a white ribbon or a silver ribbon. But um, I, I think it does illustrate the fact that, you know, if you ask people um, what type of cancer kills the most women in the United States each year, what are they going to say most of the time? Yeah, well, that's wrong, right? You're going to always get that right on any exam. It's going to be lung cancer. Uh, twice as many women die each year of lung cancer than breast cancer. So um, it's kind of tough sometimes in November because we're coming off Breast Cancer Awareness Month uh, and people are a little fatigued with the whole cancer thing. Um, and we only have a couple of weeks before the holidays, but we try to make the most of it, and I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Um, Hopefully, I can give you some pearls, and you can share um, share this information with uh, your friends and family and your community. So I'm just going to kind of go through a little lung cancer 101. I think Paige, Artie, and Jenny both mentioned our mission. Uh, again, we want to save lives and provide support, and we do that through research. And I think we've done an excellent job raising money for research and keeping it here in North Carolina. We are so fortunate in North Carolina. We've got Duke, we've got State, we've got Wake Forest, we've got ECU, we've got Levine, we've got Wake Med, um, UNC. We just have um, a lot of expertise here in our state. So uh, research awareness, education, and then access. So um, almost you know, 1.6 million deaths worldwide from lung cancer. Um, and here in the States, it's been around 160,000 Americans die of, each lung, of lung cancer each year. So as I mentioned, it is the number one cause of cancer death in men and women. Um, if you took breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, melanoma, liver cancer, and kidney cancer, put all those deaths together, it would still be less than the number of people who die of lung cancer. So this is a very serious problem that's really been neglected in terms of research funding for many, many years. And you know, we could debate about why. Is it political? Is it tobacco? You know, is it the stigma of the disease? What is it? But um, we need to overcome it. And I think we're making I think we're making headway. Um, so lung cancer death rates, this is distribution. You can see there's definitely a propensity sort of in the what we call the tobacco belt. Um, you know, the people are a little more health aware out uh, in Utah, certainly, than on the West Coast. Um, but the death rates here in North Carolina are patchy but significant. So what is lung cancer? How does it, how does it even happen? Um, it's basically when a lung cancer cell becomes abnormal and there's uncontrolled growth. And this usually happens when there's a mutation in the DNA or the backbone of the cell. Um, and you may have heard of mutations um, with, other, with other diseases. Uh, usually one mutation um, may not be enough to actually cause the cell to behave differently. But when you get what's called multiple mutations, multiple injuries coming in the cell from all different angles, that usually is enough to tip the cell over uh, into behaving abnormally. So you can get mutations in your, I mean, we're all developing mutations right now. As we age, um, our DNA is developing mutations, so the normal aging process can cause that. And then um, toxins that we're exposed to. So everything from smoke, cigarette smoke, campfire smoke, air pollution, viruses, radon. Does anybody know what radon is? Radon is an odorless gas that lives under bedrock, typically. Um, we do have radon here in North Carolina. It, you know, it's mainly in the Northeast, um, but we have radon here in North Carolina 
Um, one of my good friends had a house on a lake. I guess it was on a granite outcrop, very high radon level in her house. You can actually get free radon tests through Radon NC. North Carolina has a state-run radon program. So just Google that and they'll send you a radon test for your house. Um, and then there are a lot of other environmental factors that can cause mutations. Um, cigarette smoke is the leading risk factor for developing lung cancer, although you do not have to have smoke to develop lung cancer by any means. But this is the leading contributor. Um, there are a lot of carcinogens in cigarette smoke, and simply inhaling hot burning ash into your lungs is very irritating and inflammatory to the lungs. Um, there's been a lot of speculation over the years about um, whether additives or menthol, things like that, could increase the chances of developing lung cancer. Um, but basically what I tell kids that, you know, vaping is all the rage now. Kids aren't really smoking cigarettes anymore, but, you know, they're all on to Juul. Um, and we don't really know what this is doing to young lungs. I can't believe that it's anything positive. Um, so what I tell people is you want to inhale the freshest, cleanest air that you can find. Just like you want to put the the freshest, whole, you know, cleanest food in your body, drink the nicest water. You don't want to drink lead-laden water. You do not want to inhale nasty air into your lungs. You want to get the cleanest air you can. So risk factors for developing lung cancer, uh, as I mentioned, the leading risk factor is the history of smoking or even secondhand smoke exposure. Um, who grew up in a household where everybody was smoking? Yeah, I mean, I remember all my, my grandmother and all her sisters smoked, so I remember uh, being trapped in the Cadillac with all the windows up and all that. <laughs> smoking me in the back seat, gasping for air. But, you know, it's that exposure that you get when you're, when you're young, when you're a young child and you're forced to breathe secondhand smoke. And if you grew up in a house where everybody was smoking, then you probably have a serious secondhand smoke exposure. In fact, um, there have been studies in taxi cab drivers back when people could smoke in cabs or even on airlines. The flight attendants won um, a lawsuit on secondhand smoke. It was one of the uh, pivotal lawsuits that actually proved that secondhand smoke was a real thing. Flight attendants were developing lung cancer because they were basically trapped on a plane with everybody smoking back in the day. Um, and so that actually helped uh, lay the groundwork for secondhand smoke and all the laws that we have now that protect us. Uh, radon, we already talked briefly about. You should definitely get your house tested for radon. Um, like I said, it's an odorless gas, so you could really not know that you were getting exposed. If you have a previous cancer, that could put you at risk for developing lung cancer, specifically cancers like head and neck cancer. Um, basically, anything um, that involves the aerodigestive tract, so when you inhale on a cigarette, not only do you smoke, uh, inhale the smoke down to your lungs, but you also swallow some of that air uh, smoke. And so you can have cancers of the head and neck, of the esophagus, of the stomach. All these can be related um, to um, smoking. Any inflammation in the lung can ultimately lead to lung cancer. Um, the surgeons used to call it scar carcinoma, these adenocarcinomas that would arise in scars in the lung, or old TB scars or old pneumonia scars, even surgical scars. Uh, and we don't see as much of these agents anymore, but toxic exposure, they used to use arsenic to treat asthma, they used to use radiation to treat acne, um, asbestos we still see some. A lot of these agents you see in people who work in industry, um, silica we see a lot in people who work in factories um, or quarries even, diesel fumes, and then viruses. Uh, and then there are genetic risks. Some people are just genetically predispositioned um, to develop these mutations that can lead to lung cancer. So basically it takes a series of mutations to create a lung cancer cell. Um, as these cells divide, these mutations are passed down, and then another toxic exposure happens, and all of a sudden you have a cancer cell. And that's a cell that basically um, exhibits the hallmarks of cancer. So this, this is sort of a classic slide about the hallmarks of a cancer cell. So basically, the cell becomes self-sufficient. So the cells in our body need signals from other cells. They need 
um, oxygen and other nutrients to grow, and they're dependent on other cells. And what happens in cancer cells is the cancer cell becomes independent. It can do its own thing. It can grow, it can spread, it can avoid our immune system. So this is one of the hallmarks um, of, of a cancer cell. Um, all of the cells in our body are programmed to grow a certain way and stop. Um, and again, a hallmark of lung cancer is that the cells start growing over those boundaries, those normal boundaries, or they start spreading. They can get into the bloodstream or the lymphatic system and spread around the body, places where they weren't designed to grow. So they can invade other tissues and spread or metastasize. They can just replicate uncontrollably, which is not typical for our cells. There's usually some sort of regulation on how the cells divide and how many. Um, they also have this um, interesting capability of calling in these weird blood vessels. It's called angiogenesis, where they send out signals, and these weird blood vessels grow into the tumor cell and provide uh, fuel for the tumor cell, but also provide a way for the cells to spread around the body. Um, and then they evade apoptosis. So apoptosis is programmed cell death. Again, our red blood cells are designed to live 120 days and they die and our bone marrow makes more red blood cells and that's the natural life cycle of our body. Uh, cancer cells avoid that and they become sort of immortal, so they don't die like they should. The programmed cell turnover gets disrupted and these cells live longer and longer. So all of these hallmarks of cancer have now become targets for our treatments. So we have targets that cut off the blood supply. We have targets that um, keep, the, keep the cells from invading and metastasizing. We have targets that target this replication process. So we are literally coming at cancer cells with a lot of different tools uh, these days. And I think we're gonna be seeing great strides in lung cancer survival over the next few years. So as I mentioned, again, if anybody ever takes boards, they will almost always ask you what type of cancer kills the most women. You can see, again, breast is a sorry second here to the uh, deaths from lung cancer. Um, again, in, lung, in men, lung cancer counts for almost a third of all cancer deaths. Um, again, prostate cancer is dragging in a second here, followed by uh, colon, uh, pancreatic, and leukemia. And this is interesting. Um, I mentioned that smoking is the biggest risk factor, but people who have never smoked can also get lung cancer. Um, and this is a group of people that some sometimes forgotten or not, not, I guess people just don't realize that you can get lung cancer if you've never smoked a cigarette in your life. Uh, but more than that, this group of non-smokers with lung cancer is now the sixth largest group of cancer deaths, okay? so. This is a significant group of people. There are more non-smoker lung cancer cases than there are Hodgkin's lymphoma, or liver cancer, or ovarian cancer, or gastric cancer, or bladder, or brain, or kidney, or myeloma. I mean, this is a major group of, of people um, who have a disease that not too many people know about, non-smokers lung cancer. Fortunately, we've made tremendous strides in special, um, special therapies just for this group. So basically there's two big types of lung cancer. There's non-small cell lung cancer, and that makes about 85% of all lung cancers, and then there's small cell lung cancer. Um, under the big umbrella of non-small cell lung cancer, you have adenocarcinoma, which is the leading histologic type now. Squamous cell is the second and large cell and then not otherwise specified. This has actually changed. 20 years ago, squamous cell was the leading histologic type. Um, and squamous cell and small cell are the two types of lung cancer that are directly associated with cigarette smoking. Um, adenocarcinoma, you can get adenocarcinoma if you've smoked, but it's frequently seen in people who've never smoked. Um, so I think this has probably happened because people actually have quit smoking. Um, and so we've seen a switch um, in the histology over the past 20 years or so. Um, 
Now, Dr. Upham can talk a little bit about this because he cures people with lung cancer with surgery. Um, you know, about 75% of people that I see when they come into the clinic are not curable. Um, and we need to fix that with lung screening. For a long time, we didn't have any way to screen people with lung cancer, but now we do. Um, but it's still sort of gaining traction. If, if I would ask one thing of, of the group, I would say, please talk to your primary care physicians and make sure that they are screening people for lung cancer who are eligible. If you're age 55 to 80, if you've smoked a pack a day for 30 years, and if you're either still smoking or stopped smoking in the past 15 years, you are eligible for lung cancer screening, and your primary care doctor needs to be screening you or referring you to a screening program like the one we have at Duke or at Wake Med or UNC. There's a lot of screening programs in the area. Um, but please make sure your primary care provider is screening their patients. Um, you know, a mammography and a colonoscopy are very high on that screening list, but for some reason, um, screening for lung cancer hasn't quite gotten the same traction. So you can see when people walk into our clinic, uh, Dr. Upham will see these patients, the patients who have early stage lung cancer, and usually before screening, most of these, a lot of these are caught with screening these days, but before screening, I mean, this was usually an incidental finding. I mean, you're going to have your hernia repaired, or you're going to have your hysterectomy, or you were in a car accident, and somehow you got a chest x-ray which showed a spot before you even had any symptoms. And that's one of the problems with lung cancer is that our lungs are inside our bodies, and they're big. They can absorb a lot of volume. It's not like a breast mass that you can feel almost instantly, or if you have prostate cancer, you can't urinate. Um, unless lung cancer blocks off an airway and you can't breathe or you get pneumonia or you cough up blood, it can grow in your body for months and months and months and you don't really have any way to feel it other than you don't feel well. You feel tired, you feel fatigued, you may lose weight. These are what we call constitutional symptoms, but they're very vague and gosh, half of us feel tired and, you know. <laughs> Not many of us lose weight, though. I always say if you, if, you, if you lose weight, you know, something's going without, especially without trying, something's going on. But um, lung cancer presentation, only 21% come in in early stage, and you can see, you know, almost half of all patients come in stage four. And that's because we just don't have, you know, we previously didn't have screening. Now we do, and hopefully, now that we have screening, we'll start seeing a shift um, so that we can catch this disease when it's curable. So staging for lung cancer, I mean, I know everybody here is stage four and they know that that's not good, um, but people don't really understand what the staging system is. And I'm just going to simplify it greatly, but basically stage one means you have a spot in your lung. So here's stage one, left lung, right lung, there's a little spot in your lung. Stage two means that not only do you have a spot in your lung, but there is a lymph node that's actually within the meat of the lung um, that's involved. And Dr. Upham will come along and he'll take that whole lobe of the lung out and you may be eligible for other treatments after surgery. Stage three is when there's a spot in the lung and now the lymph nodes that are outside of the meat of the lung but still in the middle of the chest, they, they lay along the trachea here in the middle of the chest called the mediastinum those lymph nodes are involved. And again, they're not inside the lung, they're actually outside of the lung, but still in the chest cavity. Um, and depending on how involved those lymph nodes in the middle of the chest are, you may or may not be able to have surgery. And then stage four, the cancer either gets into the bloodstream or the lymphatics and it can spread to the brain, the bone, the liver, the adrenals, skin, other lung, um, throughout the body and that's stage four. Traditionally, stage four has not been a curable situation, um, but that may be changing. I mean, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about immunotherapy, which is quite exciting, but um, there are so many new treatments that are so dramatic, it's almost miraculous that are happening these days, um, that, you know, when people, when I talk to people, I, I am able to give them a lot more hope about prolonged remissions, and who knows, maybe even cure. So these are the lymph nodes that uh, Dr. Upham looks at when he evaluates people with lung cancer. We want to know which one of these lymph nodes are involved so we can figure out what stage you are. Okay, now this is the trachea. You can see the trachea here. That's your breathing tube. 
it comes down and it splits. The tube goes off to the left lung, to the right lung, um, and the lymph nodes kind of live all around here. Some outside the meat of the lung and some of them are actually inside the meat of the lung. So it's very important to know how many lymph nodes are involved. And this is one way um, that we can do this. Again, Dr. Upham can make a little incision here and slide a scope down and biopsy. This is an outpatient procedure. You do have to be put to sleep, but you get to wake up and go home. Um, and biopsy those lymph nodes so we can figure out um, if there's cancer in them or not. <clears throat> we can even use an ultrasound, this is called eBus, um, where we go down with this little scope and we can ultrasound through the wall of the airway to identify a lymph node and then that helps us be sure that we are getting into the areas that we want to get into biopsy that are abnormal. So this has really helped us in diagnosing people and making sure we get the proper staging. So current status of, of lung cancer these days, we have um, histology directed therapy, we have therapies that are aimed at um, non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, at squamous cell lung cancer. We have um, biomarker directed therapy. Uh, these are directed specifically at targeted mutations. Um, we have immunotherapy, which is the newest kid on the block that's had some very dramatic re um, results. And then we're running, we're starting to run into problems with um, the cancer cells becoming kind of smart and learning how to trick our therapies. Um, and so we're figuring out new drugs and other ways to overcome resistance. So we're moving away from lung cancer as kind of a stamp uh, situation. When I first started uh, treating people with lung cancer, we had one chemotherapy combination that we just basically treated everybody with. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of options. <laughs> we didn't have a lot of drugs. But now we are customizing the therapy to whatever um, the situation dictates in terms of mutations, exposures, strategies. So we have different strategies for these different subsets of lung cancer. Lung cancer are people who never smoked. Lung cancer are people with mutations. Lung cancer are people who have a very strong immune system. So we're, very, we're customizing the care and this has really, really made a difference. These are some of the mutations um, that we can see in lung cancer. KRAS is one that's associated with cigarette smoking, and this is a pretty bad mutation. It can uh, bode resistance. Uh, EGFR is one of the more common ones we see in people who have never smoked, followed by ALK. ROS1 didn't make this list. BRAF here. Um, MET is not a good one. So you can see there's a lot of mutations, and we're learning more and more about lung cancer every day. So immunotherapy, vaccines, checkpoint inhibitors, these are all ways to activate your own body to fight lung cancer. So chemotherapy is like a cluster bomb. It kills the cancer cells, but it also has a lot of side effects. Um, immunotherapy is more of a natural treatment. It basically helps your own immune system fight and kill the cancer. So we're all making cancer cells right now, but our immune system is seeing those cancer cells, killing them, and we basically break them down and pee them out, basically. Um, what happens in lung cancer is the cells become tricky and they camouflage themselves from your immune system. So your immune system is trying to find the cells that literally can't see them. Um, I think I've got a, here's a little picture. So here's the tumor cell and what it likes to do, it has a camouflage over it like a cloaking agent. I don't know, was Harry Potter had that invisible cloak? I don't know. Um, basically it's cloaked itself from from the cancer killing cells in our body, which are T cells. And it also kind of strong arms the T cell. It has these proteins that sticks out and it keeps the T cell away from it so it can't attack it and kill it. So what our new agents do basically is they take that break or that strong arm away so the T cell can actually get into the tumor cell, identify it and kill it. So it's very cool treatment. Um, and we've seen some very dramatic responses. This is one of Dr. Crawford's patients. Um, this is a backbone, this is a lung, that's the, um, this is the uh, scapula um, or your shoulder blade. And you can see this person had a big mass in the top of their right lung. It's going into their armpit. So you can see it's kind of eating away through the ribs. Here's the lung mass and going into the armpit looks very painful. 
Um, but after uh, immunotherapy with a drug called nivolumab, you can see that it's melted away, and a year later, not only has it still melted away, but it's like healing. So this is pretty, pretty amazing and dramatic. All right, so the immune system, we're learning a lot. We're starting to combine different immune agents. Um, you know, I hear a lot about PDL1, but that is not the only um, predictor of whether immunotherapy is going to work. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of um, uh, other influences. Mutational load is very important. That's how many mutations are in the tumor. Uh, there are microenvironmental influences like hypoxia and metabolism. <coughs> A lot of things involved with the immune system. So the trends in managing lung cancer, basically, there is a lot of hope these days. And so if there's anything I want to tell anybody, you know, there's a lot of hope if you have lung cancer, and there's a lot of hope for screening, for keeping people from, you know, developing later stage lung cancer. Um, we've got earlier detection, we've got imaging, we've got less invasive surgeries. Um, Dr. Upham can just make a little tiny incision these days and stick a scope in. In the old days, we had to open up people's whole chests. Uh, we have immunotherapy, targeted agents, chemotherapy. There's just a lot of different ways to treat uh, people with lung cancer these days. So if you have lung cancer or if you have a loved one or a friend, I encourage you um, to develop a team because um, we all need the support of a team. I have a team that works with me that's amazing, that helps me take care of people with lung cancer. Uh, family and friends, I think advocacy groups like the Lung Cancer Initiative are extremely important. We've already mentioned social media. Care bridges are great. Gosh, that's so great for people. Because, um, you know, a lot of people don't want to ask for help or they can't ask for help. And so to have somebody put together a care bridge where, you know, you don't really have to ask. People just sign up to help you is really a wonderful thing. Um, your local medical team, uh, again, we're blessed here uh, in Wake County and in the Triangle in general. Um, consulting uh, physicians, and then you know, spiritual support and, and even more. So put together your team of hope, um, and we look forward to partnering with you. I appreciate you coming out tonight. I'm uh, Trevor Upham. I'm a new thoracic surgeon in town uh, over at uh, Wake Med, and I was asked to just kind of speak about the ha lung cancer happenings at Wake Med and what is this Cancer Care Plus thing going on around town. Um, you know, Wake Med, as, as you know, it's not really a, a cancer center or it doesn't have the, the resources of, of, of Duke initially, and so uh, Wake Med, though, it has a lot of cancer patients that have already been taken care of, been have had been taken care of at, at Duke and, and at UNC around the area. Wow, we just kind of have a, a formal team and a, a, a growing, strengthening team to take care of patients in Wake County and, and surrounding areas. But first, let me just chat a little bit about the uh, minimally invasive surgeries of, of how we take care of early stage lung cancer and some later stage lung cancers, sometimes people just need biopsies through minimally invasive techniques. Unfortunately, uh, minimally invasive surgery, I would consider the standard of care, but just uh, now we're approaching 50% of all the lobectomies where we remove a whole lobe of the lung are being done through small incisions around the country. In big cities, I think most people are fortunate to have minimally invasive trained surgeons that take out the, the lobes of lungs through small incisions, but it's only about half of the patients for early stage lung cancer are getting uh, lobectomies done through small incisions right now. I think that number will continue to change as, as the younger surgeons get out there, but it's still uh, an unfortunate number. We do it through, this is uh, the, uh, a patient who had a lobectomy, and you have to make an incision. You still have to make an incision big enough to get the lobe of the lung out, but you can get a whole a large portion of the lung out through that little small incision you can see right under there underneath uh, the nipple. Um, you can see there's a chest tube there. We do leave a chest tube still at the end of doing a surgery, but we uh, use that same port for the camera and then do the rest of the surgery through uh, that other small incision. Sometimes it requires one or two other small incisions to kind of get the right angles for surgery. Uh, the, the way we, we do it, you know, uh, opioids are getting uh, a, a, a bad name for some good reasons these days and people are realizing a lot of the narcotic pain medicines aren't good for patients for a, a, a number of reasons, not just addiction, but it, it affects your, your mind, how your bowels work, 
it, it, it affects your energy level. So we use a lot of adjuncts to uh, opioid pain medicines, a lot more uh, non-narcotic pain medicines, such as uh, a numbing medicine and, and kind of fat globules that dissolves over three days. The use of that actually has substituted the use of epidurals, which is more comfortable for patients, and there's less complications related with the injection of these fat globules that dissolve over three days. People don't have to go to the ICU for close blood pressure monitoring like they do need with epidurals. So that's what uh, liposomal bupivacaine is. And we use a lot of things, people still need narcotic pain medicine for, for these surgeries, but we use a lot of things in addition or in place of them uh, to recover quickly from surgery. And we expect patients to stay a, a shorter time in the hospital. In the old days, you, you'd get a thoracotomy and uh, people would stay in the hospital probably about a week or so. Now with uh, minimally invasive techniques, people are expected we, to stay on average, nationally it's about f five days, but most of our patients stay about two to three days after surgery and then they go home. The reasons to do it through small incisions is, is not just to, to show off a, our, our pictures here at presentation, say look what we did through these small holes. There are so many uh, advantages to it. It does actually take a little bit more time in the operating room. And that costs a little bit more in the operating room, but the overall cost of removing uh, portions of your lung through small incisions is lower uh, by doing it through these small incisions because people get out of the hospital sooner, they don't spend as much time in the ICU, they have less complications, things like atrial fibrillation, and they have less bleeding complications. And then, you know, what's arguably the most important is not the size of your incision, but your cancer outcome from, from these. Uh, I would say I just want the best cancer outcome regardless of the size of incision. And, but great news, this, this, the, the small incisions actually have better cancer outcomes. It's due to a, a number of reasons, some we know and some we don't know, uh, that we think that doing the smaller incisions that might have a less immunosuppressive effect on the body and you don't want to be immunosuppressed when you have cancer. So we think the people that recover quicker from surgery might uh, be uh, having better response to cancer due to that. People that go on to need more chemotherapy or radiation after surgery, they recover quicker, and we know that the quicker people bounce back and the better they recover, the more they're able to, to, to tolerate the chemotherapy and radiation, and uh, the, the, the more doses and the higher doses of those things you get typically, the, the better you do. And also through these small incisions and the camera, we're able actually to often stage uh, lung cancers better, uh, particularly with the, the robot. I'll tell you about what, what the robot is in a minute, but uh, particularly with robotic surgery, we're able to remove more lymph nodes. And more lymph nodes doesn't really add to the overall survival of these lung cancer patients at this point based on our studies, but it, it makes sure we get better staging of lung cancer patients so that the people that do need more therapy are identified to get that therapy before it just comes back and it's too late. So that's uh, kind of the advantages of why we do lung cancer through through small incisions now. Um, at, 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 uh, speaking mainly about Wake Med and, and Duke Raleigh, but our friends at, at, at Rex and, and UNC do similar things. I think we have a, a, a stronger and bigger and more progressive team, but they have some of these same tricks as well. But uh, at Wake Med Raleigh and in Wake Med Cary, we do lung cancer uh, surgery, and at Duke Raleigh, sometimes using uh, the robot. The robot is the robot's not actually doing surgery, it's still surgeons doing surgery, but it's often interesting to tell people that don't know how it works, is it's actually, that if you'll see in the middle of the screen, there's a, a, a fake patient in the middle with all this big machine around the patient. There's a, a bedside assistant, that's often one of the physician's assistants or uh, a, a specially trained nurse that assists at the bedside. The surgeon is actually not sterile, sitting not far, probably about six feet in the corner of the room at a console, literally like a video game console that has uh, a better optics and kind of a, a 3D picture and you have a sort of a joystick that allows you to use the instruments that are placed inside the patient through small holes uh, to, to, to better uh, manipulate your, your hands inside a patient. It helps particularly in chest surgery because you can it allows three-dimensional rotation of the chest to kind of get in there and scoop out those lymph nodes and get around the big blood vessels that you just want to get around and not into. Um, and uh, everyone in the room can watch it, it on, on, on 
the screen there, and that allows for just better interaction between the surgeons and anesthesia and the nurses in the room, and everyone's all on the same page and, and knows, knows what's happening. Uh, Dr. Garst mentioned a little bit about EBUS. That's one of the ways we, we uh, stage uh, and sometimes diagnose uh, lung cancer patients. And, you know, it's done with people asleep, uh, and then you put an ultrasound down through the airways to, to biopsy the, either lymph nodes uh, around the lung or sometimes the lung tumors that are right around the major airways. This technology is, uh, it's, it has uh, replaced in some settings the incision that is made on, on the neck, but sometimes we still do need to make the incision on the, on the neck to go down on, on top of the airway and sample the lung nodes. This technology actually has evolved to something called navigational bronchoscopy where you can imagine we use this ultrasound to just get the, the some masses and lymph nodes around the center of your chest but now there's something called navigational bronchoscopy that uses ultrasound and then pairs in a computer algorithm with a CT scan to develop a, a, another sort of video game like roadmap where in, 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 a, in an endoscopy suite uh, typically, it's a, a pulmonologist goes down with the bronchoscopy and can wind out to the nodules far out in the lung and take biopsies of potential cancers there. It's just other ways that we're able to get uh, cancer diagnoses that without making even the small cuts on, on patients. People go home the same day, don't need those, those chest tubes. Uh, so this, this is a technology that's available uh, in town. We're soon to have it up and running, uh, fully functional at Duke Raleigh for access for the wake med and the Duke Raleigh patients. And then, you know, not all patients, uh, most patients don't get diagnosed with early stage uh, lung cancer. Um, and even those some that are diagnosed with early stage lung cancer sometimes go on to uh, uh, recur and need chronic drainage of their, their, their chest space. Uh, uh, Duke and, and, and wake med, are, are, we use a lot of uh, Plurex catheters in those situations. We we found that people uh, don't like coming into the hospital every few days to have their chest drained. They need to spend uh, their time is better spent at home uh, with these easy to manage uh, catheters uh, draining fluid out. Sometimes with the help of nurses at home, but oftentimes with a little training from nurses, they're able to just manage these at home with their family members. <laughs> so I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what is this Cancer Care Plus. Um, you know, I uh, previously worked and trained at, at, at some of the, I think there's like 50 comprehensive cancer care centers in the country. In, in North Carolina, it's, it's, it's Duke, UNC, and Wake Forest. What a, a comprehensive cancer center is a special NCI designation for uh, a center that provides, you know, the, the most progressive and a comprehensive amount of resources to patients. Here, here in Wake County, though, Cancer Care Plus is basically trying to allow the access and the services of a comprehensive cancer care center here in Wake County to anyone here or anyone that comes here. So we are, what it is, has done is allied the, the folks at Duke Raleigh with the folks at Wake Med and all the Wake Med centers and all the local Duke centers to kind of work on one, one big team so that any patient with a cancer diagnosis gets plugged into the network and is getting the same care here that they would be getting at Stanford or Harvard or Big Duke or UNC without having to drive hours or fly places. They'll have access to all of the clinical research protocols that, that are uh, the, at the forefront of often stage four cancer therapies so that they don't have to travel for this. People don't want to travel if they don't have to to get their cancer care and in Wake County you don't have to. Um, at Wake Med, one of the biggest advantages we've had at, 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 at Duke Raleigh, they've had them for a while, but now we have patient navigators. We actually, uh, we, uh, we took one of uh, Duke Raleigh's uh, thoracic cancer navigators, Brenda Wilcox, to lead our initiative over at, at, at Wake Med. And patients really benefit from cancer navigators to help them guide them to the appointments, keep the doctors in check to make sure they're doing things in an efficient manner to get people to and through uh, a diagnosis and a therapy as quick as possible. I actually, I asked Brenda for a picture, but she wouldn't send one to me, but I actually found a paper that she published uh, describing patient navigation as a win-win for all involved. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a win for the, for the patients and the providers. Patient navigators are just a blessing for anyone with cancer. They 
Uh, they, they really are good advocates and, nav and truly navigators. And we have them now at Wake Med for, for all cancers, not just lung cancer. And it's, 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 it's a great uh, resource. And it, they, uh, Brenda and, and her team plug folks in with uh, people at, at Duke Raleigh right away for appointments and, and, and meetings and, and lead them to the, to the right places. Also, um, you know, tumor boards are an important part of cancer care. Tumor boards are where basically everyone gets together and, and has a team, team meeting. It often involves surgeons, medical oncologists, sometimes pulmonologists, radiation oncologists, radiologists to help us interpret the pictures, and pathologists for us to look at slides. Getting everyone together in one room to discuss patients at, on an individual basis, I think is is should is the standard of care for uh, any cancer patient, not just lung cancer patients. And we are working towards merging all of these tumor boards in Wake County for our patients, and hopefully be able to offer this to a, a resource for for patients that get referred into Wake County as well. So already we have collaboration of the tumor boards between uh, Wake Med and Duke Raleigh. The technology they're just we're putting in a bunch of screens with cameras. And already we're linking in with Big Duke to get updates on protocols for our, for our tumor boards. We're meeting together as a group to get our pathologists to stay as up to date with the new special stains that Dr. Garst needs to give this new targeted therapy so that we aren't, aren't going to fall a step behind the, the, the cutting edge of, of, of cancer care therapy. Uh, it's, we're but putting together the campuses of, of Wake Med, Duke Raleigh, and Big Duke, I think, is, is an exciting thing for all, all patients and providers in, in Wake County and, and, and beyond. And with that, as I mentioned, research protocols. Uh, there's you, the, the cancer centers uh, in around the country and in North Carolina, they have the most protocols still, but a lot of them uh, will be open at Duke Raleigh and then eventually uh, for patients as well as Wake Med, which offers uh, patients experimental therapies when the uh, approved and, and in conventional therapies aren't, aren't accepted. And so. We hope that uh, patients that uh, will be able to enroll more in research protocols, which will be good not just for them, uh, but for people after them to get the best care. And then, as Dr. Garz mentioned, lung cancer screening is a huge thing and one of the, I think, one of the important focuses that we, we all can have in, in, for the lung cancer uh, community. <laughs> Smoking is on the decline, but still in our area, it's twice the national national average. Um, lung cancer screening has proven survival benefits at a population level. It's difficult to implement because primary care doctors don't it, struggle to order more tests because they're under the gun to not order more tests. But we actually had a, a whole dinner just the other night with a bunch of primary care physicians around Raleigh and, and surrounding areas to talk about this as you need to do this. Uh, one of the primary care physicians we invited to speak told them like, you are liable if you do not order a lung cancer screen on anyone over the age of 55 that has smoked uh, within the last 15 years or, or currently smoking uh, and has smoked 30 pack years. You are liable. I don't know if that legally is true, but I think, you know, as an advocate, primary care physicians should be screening a lot more. Right now they're only screening somewhere between five, typically it's about 5% of the eligible population uh, around the country. It's, it's shocking and at a test by test basis, more than mammograms and some forms of colon cancer screening, it's more effective at picking up lung cancers. It's not without its downside. There's, you know, false positives that get picked up, but the benefits have proven out in studies that this will save lives uh, at the community level. So at, at uh, Wake Med, we have a team of, this is all our, our pulmonologists and interventional pulmonologists that are involved in lung cancer screening. We get together every two weeks to, to go over all of the, the high-risk screens, and we plug them in to go come see surgeons uh, if it's very strongly suspicious uh, for a cancer, or if it's something that needs to be followed, then they go see our pulmonologists at our outpatient uh, area. Uh, lung, lung nodules do show up in, in all sorts of ways, shapes, or form. We established a, a, a nurse navigator, not for, for cancers itself, but for any nodules, just so that we don't miss them in our system. We get a lot of trauma patients at Wake Med, and a lot of them are smokers and drinkers, and they have uh, 
often uh, positive findings in, in their lungs that we need to follow. So we have encouraged uh, uh, them to call our 350 lung no nodule and they make sure that they get in our database and so they won't slip through the cracks and we can follow these nodules and, and do our best to prevent them from growing into advanced cancers and catching them early. With lung cancer uh, screening, one of the most important parts of it is actually the tobacco cessation part of lung cancer screening programs. Uh, Duke now has a tobacco cessation screening clinic where people can go to Monday through Friday. It's, it's, it's the first of its kind that I know of in Raleigh and when it's off hours there's numbers they can call. That is huge. That will, it's, it's good not only for people without cancers but people with cancers and um, to, to, to work on the difficult struggle to, to quit smoking. But uh, Wake Med and, uh, and, and Duke Raleigh have lung cancer screening uh, programs. We're actually with, with this collaborative going to kind of align our resources and hopefully make them even more powerful to get even more patients uh, captured uh, by lung cancer screening. So that pretty much, uh, I think, uh, sums up kind of my review of what's going on in, in, in Wake County and, and thoracic surgery. But it's a, it's a, it's a good time in, in Wake County for all lung cancer uh, patients and providers. Thank you.